Hi, I believe we are live and set uh, for our online discussion. I'm Suman Tri, so connecting to you from uh, WSC the Museum. This is our Akuru Collective Hub at the Ralavata um, location in Sri Lanka. And we have our, uh, three speakers ready. We also have a, uh, an audience and the team behind um, uh, the Akuru Collective here. Just say, uh, we have, this is, Hi. so we are ready to take your questions and we are already uh, uh, for a very interesting evening. So for the audience, we have nearly uh, 20 members uh, online right now, listening, waiting to, I'm sure, waiting to listen to the lovely speakers. So just to give a quick um, update on what's going to happen today uh, is uh, the two speakers will be telling us something very interesting on what they're doing, their research. Starting off with uh, Dr. Pedro Amado, and then followed by Dr. Udaya, and then Dr. Joe. And so we have all really uh, amazing panel here. So, um, to, and then after every speaker, what I will do is I will be asking a question that will come from the audience itself, uh, one or two based on the time limit we have, followed by uh, uh, each speaker, then thereafter, at the conclusion, we will uh, open up for uh, overall discussion on the topic. So I am going to open the floor to Pedro. And uh, so just a quick, um, for the audience who's listening to us, uh, Dr. Pedro um, holds a PhD in Science and Technology of Communication from University of Aveiro. Uh, he's currently an assistant professor of web. I know it's quite interesting to have this type of a person coming uh, on board, but that is exactly what makes typography very really interesting. And of course, um, his areas of subject is uh, web design, interaction, creative coding, typography, and typeface design. So he is a founding member of the A-Typo uh, Typography Association and also the country delegate for the A-Type-I. And he focuses his research and development activities on computational and post-digital typography and editorial design, as well as uh, human computer interaction. So over to you, Pedro. OK, thank you very much for this nice presentation. I'm, I'm actually quite honored to be here. So thank you, uh, uh, first of all. Uh, uh, to, to, to know the Akuru Collective, uh, that I only know from from Instagram, sorry, <laughs> and and you personally from the from the invitation from you, Sumatri. Thank you very much. We are, we actually met in Aveiro a few years ago in person, so it's very nice to be here uh, seeing you again. Um, well, I'm only able to follow you online, so yes, uh, <laughs> this is very nice uh, opportunity. So thank you all. So I'll be switching to my screen now. Uh, oh, okay. So I switched browsers. Just one second. Se second screen. Open preferences, and now it's Google complaining. OK. <laughs> OK. So share, maybe. Are you seeing this? Yes, we are. Yeah, so I'll just switch to full screen today, preferably. OK. Um, and I'll try to follow you. If, if anything goes, because I'm not seeing this, your 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 face, just tell me something on on by audio. So yeah. I'll be presenting the, um, uh, as asked, uh, uh, part of our research that we were actually working, still working on it this morning with uh, Katarina and Vitor. Uh, these are my fellow colleagues from other schools. Uh, Vitor Calles is also a, an ATIPI country delegate from Portugal, and Katarina is, is a really nice uh, friend of ours, uh, and we've been interested in this. So, um, I'll be presenting you the, the this context. I believe everyone knows what letterpress is. Letterpress is the, the craft, the, te the technology, the medium of working with movable type, with movable characters, to set compositions, uh, usually using this kind of thing, uh, small letters um, that you, you, you set on a composing stick, and then you set um, spaces on the sides or in between words, and then you set lines, line spaces. And this is usually what happens to us every time we work. 
So when you try to pick up all these shapes, these letters, these lines, these words, and take it all into the composition, the composing stone or the the, the composing, uh, I don't know the word, the frame, and uh, put it in the printer, everything falls down if you don't lock it. So you set compositions and you, you, you pick up these letters and usually some drawings, some engravings, some, some we call it engravings, gravuras, uh, yeah, well, shapes, uh, figures. Um, and you set it all, you lock it, and you print it. So this was the standard yeah, for, for centuries until photo composition um, took over. Well, there were some technical improvements, but photo composition changed everything around 1950s. And then the, the introduction of, of digital systems in late 60s and early 70s on storage and um, photo digitalization, and then uh, the industry started to move faster because we wanted to move um, as, a, as a country to follow the rest of the countries. But as a whole, the industry was trying to produce printed material faster and cheaper. So, of course, um, letterpress uh, was very expensive, to very labor intensive and very expensive to maintain. And so new technologies were adopted. Our last, um, we have a, we have a, um, I think every country has uh, the um, the national mint, the 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 printing house that produces the money, if uh, merged with the national printing editions printing house. So the the money making machine and the 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 official um, how do you call it? The official editional uh, edi edi editing uh, um, uh, production office merged, and then the last national. Printers Founders Specimen Catalog was printed in 1978. I have there 1979 because my edition says 1979 and I don't know why. Um, so the, the last time they issued, well, original or, 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 or franchise type was in 1979. And as far as we know from, from uh, verbal um, testimonies, uh, the mechanical composition, so the, the compositors, the persons who were doing letterpress, uh, ended in late 1980s. So by the early 1990s, the National Printing House didn't have manual uh, compositing. So they did it all by photocomposition or digital systems. So uh, this is just a, a few, uh, one of the first catalogs from the right from 1978, from the left from 1870s. And this is an image from the last catalog they produced. So if you, for a frame of reference, uh, the first one is like, uh, I don't know, 30, 35 centimeters high. Um, I don't know how to say this in, in, in inches. So maybe it's like 12 inches uh, high. And this one is really small. This one is geared toward the compositor uh, to, to have in the print studio, to have in your pocket. So this is pocket sized uh, catalog. Uh, and this ended. Uh, to, to, to give you a rough estimate, when I went to college, um, we we no longer have even the photo compositing. We started directly in digital systems. So lately, uh, me personally from 2012 and lately in the last, uh, I don't know, five to 10 years, um, we've witnessed a resurgence of interest uh, in our country to preserve materials um, such as printers, such as letterpress sorts. Um, and for designers like me, trained in digital design in computers, to uh, experiment and learn with this craft. And to, to witnesses, I can show it later in video, personally, because I, I think you're only seeing the, um, I think you're only seeing my, my desktop, sorry, I'm, you're not seeing me, okay. okay. So uh, this is, I'll, I can show you, this is an even smaller booklet that has been produced in 2000, 2016 by a designer friend of, of mine from Coimbra, from a nearby town, uh, called Joana Monteiro uh, over here, uh, and Ruben Diaz he is also a colleague of mine. They reproduced with original uh, figures, um, they re-reproduced a small printing manual for, um, for people who wanted to learn more. Uh, so for people who do workshops in Coimbra and stuff like this. So we've seen this kind of interest going on. Actually, this is Ruben you're seeing in the picture from Typografia Diaz when he was in Lisbon. So slowly, people like me, designers, enthusiasts, are getting excited with this technology and are trying to maintain it, to rescue the equipment, to rescue the, the cabinets of type. Um, and this led us to, 
to to this led us me uh, Katerina and Vitor to develop this 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 work so what is the role of traditional letterpress in Portugal today well we 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 expected it to not to be uh, so different from other countries because we know this happened and it's still happening in other countries we were as usual in Portugal we're kind of five to ten years later um, than other people so we wanted to know uh, what is the role of the of letterpress in Portugal so to answer this, we needed to discover currently operating studios, authors, and workshops um, uh, still uh, that still had letterpress material in use, and to characterize these workshops and, uh, and their production, of course, in order to understand if this is just a small niche, if it's, if it's just a, a trend um, and it will go away, or if it's actually um, like, I don't know, like other technologies like film photography or something that is actually being preserved in time. So are we actually going in a revival of letterpress or is it just a trend? So we we mapped the, the, the state of the art. There are currently several designers and workshops operating in the Portuguese letterpress scenario. And we can sort them in two kinds. On the one hand, there are the workshops that are still in operation with professional typesetters or printers that were formerly trained. Uh, for example, up north in Tipografia dos Anjos, um, or Confiança. So the old guys, there are still, that were trained uh, in official official way. On the other hand, there are several studios and workshops run by professional graphic designers, like Ruben Dias that you saw in the previous picture, that had no formal training in letterpress, and they search for it. They are, they are starting to acquire equipment and learn from this, uh, learn this craft either from old guys or from old books or just doing errors. So despite this generation gap and different backgrounds, all of them are working to together to preserve this knowledge and practice. So we actually went there to the, to the, to the places and you're seeing father and son on the left, um, Vitor and Jay from, um, actually this is a school where they work. So on the left here, maybe you don't see my mouse here. On the left, Jose is a professionally trained uh, compositor and Vitor is his son, so he learned from him. So we could actually say that Vitor is a graphic designer who has been professionally trained, but this is not the the, the reality. We we went there when we talked with a, with a sample of people because we do this always in our, in our holidays. Um, and uh, this is our country. Maybe I should have mapped our country in, in the world. I don't know if you know. This is just the tip of Europe. Um, uh, and we actually went, uh, of, like many other countries, the, the most developed or the, the economy is most developed in, the, in Lisbon, the capital. So in the coast, this is the sea. This is the Atlantic Sea. Uh, and here is our city, Porto. So this is the, the main city, the capital, and this is the second largest city in Portugal. So we went more or less in the in the in the seaside, and I've actually went to Azores that should be in the middle of the Atlantic, um, and we went to the to some of the the workshops, and we talked to the people, and um, and we went to their studios to to learn best their uh, working conditions and practices. So there are three. There are two kinds, workshops that are still in operation with professional typesetters or printers formally trained, and studios and workshops run with professional graphic designers or, or collectives uh, with no formal training. So from this original list of 23 people we knew, we grew by a snowball sampling the, the, um, the known universe to 39 other workshops. And uh, we have more or less around now, uh, uh, the number is near the 50 workshops. We're not mapping every uh, studio that has a letterpress or a Heidelberg material. We're, we're mapping workshops that have their doors open to the public, that are engaged with this active preservation and uh, passing uh, the, the knowledge to other people. So these two groups, formal training, and we can see here uh, the father, João Damasceno, in Coimbra. So this is Coimbra, in a city in the middle of of Portugal, and we actually see here Manuel Pedro, one of our main references. I can show you a book later uh, from him with, in a photograph. I was searching for his, it's very funny because we have a, a national ID card of uh, a printer's official, and I, I couldn't find it, but may, maybe later I can send to Sumantri. 
So we have two, two generations and one that has technical training, other that does this in an experimental approach. So the production ranges from books to booklets, to posters, to cards, to flyers, and it depends on the, uh, on the available material or machinery of the workshop. Of course, there are workshops that have bigger formats, of course, and other ones that just have handheld presses. Uh, but nevertheless, they all highlighted the importance of doing an experimental approach. And this is one of the first um, uh, innovative uh, approaches, or it wasn't, it, it wasn't a surprise, but it was very funny to see the old guys being open to an experimental approach. If you know the old printers, whenever the ink gets smudged or something, they could slap you in the face. But now they actually embrace it and they encourage it and they like to play with it with it because they see these younger generations actually having fun with it and seeing an interest so i think it's a, a it's a different marketing strategy uh, they want to they want for you to be there instead of they instead of pushing you away so uh, they all highlighted the importance of an experimental approach and use of letterpress and the majority mentioned the need for them a technical somewhat uh, explanation so um Learning the craft in a workshop is very important, uh, and I can test, uh, testify this having trying to learn this this craft, this technology, uh, more or less single handedly. Um, and whenever I go into a workshop, I always ask something, and I always try to get some knowledge from it, and I always try to give them something back um, with with someone who was trained. Uh, it's it's not possible to learn this technology uh, theoretically by the books or by videos. You have to you have to feel it. You have to have it in your hands. So you have to go there. Um, and uh, one of the things that most excites me, and uh, it's one of the most uh, important messages, it's the material materiality and the experimentalism of this craft. Uh, and have in mind because have in mind my profile because I cross between web design and interaction design and programming. And, and sometimes I'm going to my garage and doing inks. And I find and find these two approaches, these two completely polarized approaches, uh, part of the same creative spectrum. So you, I feel the code as much as I feel the ink and the lead in my hands. So you really need to have this physical experience in order to understand it. And some some of them really mentioned this, and this is becoming even more important today, especially in pandemic times when everyone is, is struggling to figure out what to do, um, how to work. S working slower, because working with physical materials and setting the white space and locking things and things falling down really forces you to work slower, but in a more responsible and... Uh, how do I say this? Uh, and to, uh, in a way that you have to foresee the results because it takes a long time to get a, something printed. So if it's wrong and if you take a lot of tests, it's very frustrating. So it, it forces you to prepare to produce better. So it's very important. And, and and finally, it's a total design process. Why is this important? Because working with computers, usually you set it, you, you compose it. Live stream. Okay. Okay, okay, let me resume this again. Yes. So just going back to the slides yeah. and play. And let me just see if I can, yeah, ah, I can see you now. Okay, so I'm getting the hang of this. <laughs> uh, so uh, where was I? So um, we were seeing this uh, very, the things I was mentioning. So going back one slide, just to, to recap, it, uh, to get it. So the importance of hands-on approach, the materiality, a slower practice and a, in a total design process, they, these were all things that the people told us. Well, some things we knew, but all of them mentioned. So it was very interesting to see, we're seeing here in highlight, the yellow ones, the, um, the, the old guys who were formerly trained, but all of these guys are actually working with the younger generation and producing experimental work, uh, graphic design uh, merged processes. So uh, we see Vitor and Jose, uh, uh, Vitor and Jose, working uh, father and son. We see Raquel Rey and Diog working uh, uh, while they were uh, working alone, but we, they're working with an experienced printer. We see, for example, Vanya here in the bottom working with her father. Uh, so we're actually seeing this. We work, we're seeing Joana. Maybe the most preeminent uh, case is Joana Monteiro. And I don't know if you see my mouse, but on the corner, on the left corner, Joana Monteiro in yellow. And right beside her, uh, um, the machine, Rui the machine, 
it from Coimbra. So they actually Joano uses his workshop to produce really, really gra nice graphic design campaigns and sometimes photographing, sometimes printing uh, materials. And as you've seen before, the the um, the new small booklet from uh, Manual of Typography. So we can resume, we can synthesize the process in composing, pagination and imposing. So you compose the forms, the shapes, and then you have to set them on the page and you have to, you have to print the page. Uh, and of course, this is all done in the composing stick. This is actually uh, Quadratin Letterpress, um, uh, uh, the father working, the father of Vanya working uh, in a small uh, compositor stick. And while he was doing this, when, when we were interviewing him, he was also telling jokes and um, how do you call a prash? How do you call the haze? The haze? When people go to college, you, you, you do pranks on them. So when people went to the typography learn to learn, they would do pranks on them. So they would make them find the the bugs that were no bugs. Of course, there are a lot of bugs, but they were they <laughs> trying to get them to find something, or they get, got them to carry out some stuff, and and they were they were just playing pranks on each other. So the the the, the apprenticeship was a very a very complex thing because it, the whole process, as everyone described it. Um, well, maybe the first one you're seeing here, define the client or goals. It, maybe this is a more modern thing, but the whole process was described by everyone like this. You have to know what to do. You have to know what you have available for printing. So this is a very important thing because on the computer, you never run out of sorts. You never run out of A's or B's. And of course, when setting a title, sometimes you have a, a, an Ypsilon, um, a Y, sorry, uh, Y in English, uh, and in Portuguese, of course, we didn't have Ys. So this is very strange, so we, we had to make up stuff. Uh, and then you had to do the first uh, mock-up and then compose it and then proof it and then to paginate it and then to impose it. And then things didn't fit and then you had to manage the white space and set it on the on the page. And then finally, you printed it. And then the, the, the printer's apprentice, the printer's devil came into place. And then the slave, well, like, we call them, <laughs> it had to pick up everything and get it again in the cases. It, they have to clean it up and and um, and set it in the in the drawers again. Um, and there there was a second. Uh, usually they divided the space from composing and printing and then to the finishings. So then you had to send all the printing stuff to be binded and I don't know uh, glues or something. Um, so this is the whole process. So the constraints are very important. But nowadays, what we're seeing is um, the constraints versus the possibilities. So now the possibilities is to merge this in a digital process. So now we can, of course, we can design this more or less faster because we can preview it on the computer. But then the computer doesn't have the sorts or the, the sizes exactly right as we have on the workshop. So this kind of speeds up things. But at the same time, it doesn't because we have to check again everything in the physical world. Um, and and we have this network, this map of active uh, letterpress workshops uh, that we can uh, source, so we can contact. This was one of our main drivers, so was to know who was there, who was willing to share knowledge, who was willing to lend the space or the material for us to work. And we've mapped the, the, that list. And, and of course, uh, events like this, um, this is... Um, Tipu, so type, a uh, meeting of typographical printers. Maybe this is the best translation in English. It was held in the Azores in the middle of the Atlantic. And what was really fun for, for well, for me to attend this, is you see here in the image, in the right in the middle of the image, Alan Kitching, or you can, you can see Manuel Diogo, or Christian Granados, or uh, Roberto Gamonal, or here in the corner, in the upper left corner, Professor Guillermino Pires, who was the director of the National Printing uh, office for a bunch of years uh, and the, all these people from different generations got together and and started sharing uh, well they're sharing their work discussing uh, so we're, we're actually seeing this here in our in our country so we we see these uh, challenges now um, finally uh, I think the main challenge for the letterpress today is of course the commercial viability we've seen this revival of interest but it's no longer tradition. Uh, it's no longer viable to do it in the traditional way because it takes a lot of time, and 
clients want to work ready for yesterday. And we don't have time for experiment to, to spend a whole week in the workshop to try to do stuff, different stuff. So letterpress in Portugal, of course, it's completely a new practice, as I think it is in all the countries. But that at the same time that this is a challenge, this is an opportunity because we we are able to find new and interesting ways to use it and, of course, combine it with other technologies. Um, we we see the printing press is still working, producing hard covers and and uh, deep embosses. But now the 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 thing that was once the the kiss perfect impression. And now let me just share this picture. This is a book I bought the, the uh, this holiday. This is uh, Jan Chisels, um, uh, illustrated history of writing. And my surprise was that this uh, this uh, map, this map tree is set in traditional, well, a whole, the whole book is set in letterpress. But what amazed me is that the guys set this with rulers and they had to do the math to get it right. And it's like slightly bent, but it's it's a perfect impression. And you see that the, the it's what it's called the kiss impression because it, the, the material does a lot of, of weight and a lot of pressure in the paper, but it's perfect. And here you see what I produced uh, a couple of weeks ago. Even when I'm trying to produce a, uh, a flat impression i do it like this and it's like really really deep impression so maybe they would kill me if i do this in the <laughs> in the old days but yeah well now i think everyone everything is allowed and this experimentation like we did in the azores we're seeing this uh, we're seeing here Philippe mate in the in the picture is this experimentation allows us just to have fun in the workshop this is uh, this was in the in the typographia mickey lens one of the main typographies in still operating in the search. And we see here Mestre Diniz uh, uh, closing a Chandler on a T-shirt. Why not? Uh, because, and we we all thought that the guy would say, no, we, I will not do that. When we told him, he said, yeah, 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 let's try it. I never did it, so let's try it. Um, so, and it was really, really fun. And the, then the printer jammed and it was trying to balance the flywheel. <laughs> and then we, we heard a big clink. Uh, well, sorry, it's taking a long time. So, a lot of people. The thing. Go, 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 go. And now going backwards. Okay, and now he released it. Uh, and maybe I can show it later. He was actually the first printer who taught me how to close a chase, how to close a frame, just using paper. And that blew my mind. So these guys are really pushing the envelope or just having fun with, with this stuff. Um, and of course, what, what's at the same time, it amazes me, the old traditional guys doing the tricks, doing the giving us tips, having fun with us because they are really, really nice guys. When you find a really nice printer, he's usually really nice, like your grandpa. So I, I really fell in love with, with uh, Mestre Dinesh, with Master Dinesh. So, uh, and I'm, I'm waiting for the opportunity to go back. So the, the other thing that amazes me is using new technologies like 3D printing to produce parts, sorts, letters, um, like this project from Richard Arda. I'm just showing a small clip, if this does play. J um, I'm just gonna show this, the beginning and then maybe the end of this project is called A23D from Richard Arda. You can find it available on Vimeo. Uh, and it produced uh, from um, UV printed material. It's this printer that's working here. He produced a really, really strange looking, amazing looking, complex looking letters. And then he printed it in this Albion press. Uh, maybe I can just go a bit forward. He's explaining how this works. And I want to show you his... So this is 3D printing, and then he actually designed a couple of original letters that were maybe impossible to do in lead. Maybe, I say maybe because we always see amazing stuff. So he did this wireframe letter shapes, and then he got them 3D printed, type high. Sorry, I'm just going forward. And you can see here the letters uh, in detail. I'm seeing now that I don't have the link to Vimeo, but I have it here somewhere. Sorry, I shouldn't do this without the link. So it builds the letters and then they clean them up and then they do the sorts and then they 
compose the sort, get it on the printer, lock the, the chase, and yeah, and they print it. So this is really amazing for me uh, um, to see this this mix of technologies to work. Of course, there are other projects like this open press project that maybe one day I'll do it. I don't have a, this kind of 3D printer in home at home, but they produce this really, really small uh, printer to, to do some etchings and print them. And it's really, really fun. So you do this all at home. So I, what amazes me, it's the community that is producing this kind of experiments, merging old and new. So to get back on track, here in Portugal, we see this resurgence and I can show you the, the, the catalog later. Here is Ruben Dias and one of my teachers and Sofia Meyer, Sofia Meyer here and, uh, and uh, Eduardo Weiss in the back. Um, uh, in an, a really cool exhibition on the typographical processes of book producing, pr book production, sorry, uh, with using equipment from the National Printing House. So this is the catalog. You have the link here, but if I if you need, I'll leave it later. The catalog is only in Portuguese, so yeah. Well, and then we had this big exhibition in in, la uh, in November last year uh, on the National Printing House, and uh, also a catalog produced. So we saw the the whole specimens being done, and of course, sorry, I'm doing a, a bit of self promotion here. We organized the conference uh, uh, earlier this year in our school, and you can see Richard Kegler and uh, Amelia Fontanelle in the picture showing their research. And I'm I'm using these pictures because their work really amazed me. They revived from original cast mats of William uh, William Dig William Dwiggins. Um, cloister initials, they reproduced this in several technologies, in uh, 3D printing, in uh, stereolithography, in photopolymer, in lead, because they had them cast in a monotype supercaster. Um, and uh, they tried it out and they printed it. And yeah, we had several of these guys doing an exhibition. You can see Andrew Wallis in the back also. Um, yeah, a lot of people of interest here. And of course, we're doing this stuff. We're merging the new technologies. You're seeing here a small uh, 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 a photon uh, Chinese uh, stereolithography printer. This is a really cool technology. Um, and we're seeing this all these people doing this stuff. And I, I'm also trying this stuff. I can show you later uh, in the Q&A some of these letters. Um, we're seeing this, this interest of people merging new and old, or just trying old, or just trying new. And we're seeing a reboot of, the, of this um, technology in this post-digital context. And just want to do a small shout out for, for all the guys in the videos and have this. Olá, eu chamo-me Luís Andrasteno. Esta é a minha tipografia. Eu sou tipógrafo ator. Olá, o meu nome é João Sebastião. Sou tipógrafo dos 18 anos e estou na oficina do céu. Eu sou Daniel Cláudio, tenho 28 anos, sou designer. Sou Daniel, tenho 33 anos, sou designer. Olá, meu nome é Sofia Meira, designer gráfica, esta técnica de topografia tradicional. Olá, eu sou a Vânia Nunes. Bom dia, Luís Nunes. Considero-me aprendiz de tipografia. Sou compositor tipográfico há muitos anos. <risos> Vai fazer, vai, vai fazer mais. <laughs> okay, so sorry, I just realized that this this is all in Portuguese, and I completely forgot the captioning. So these guys are all just <laughs> their names and 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 uh, thanking and uh, saying what they do. Uh, and of course, I just wanted to leave this picture here because yeah, this is. Uh, me, Katarina, and Vitor. We, this is a work uh, done by all three of us. And of course, I want to mention them because they're a really important part of this. And we couldn't do this without the help of other schools, our friends, other printers. And yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro. That was so interesting. I'm, I'm sure I, it also showed us how interested you were and the whole team was and all the discoveries. Yeah. So um, I would also open up to any uh, questions for the audience. Uh, till then, I'm just to uh, before we go into the next speaker, I just um, want to ask you, Pedro, like uh, your your 
you know, if you talk, if I talk to you, you know, in as a lecturer, what you do is completely uh, to a very modern or current day uh, subject areas. But what actually made you to go back and figure yeah. this? Out? What what led you this to this? What what well, I actually I, I didn't I didn't know what was going to happen. What 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 really brought me to this? I can I can map this out to do my second year in school. In, uh, I, I was trained as a graphic designer in in fine art school, and we we visited the National Print Museum, um, the National Press Museum. Maybe it's the name in English. Well, we have this print for us is both uh, press and print. Uh, so we saw these linotypes like, hang, like, hanging around and these linotype mats, and I completely fell in love with the mechanics and the the thing. So. I completely fell in love with with the the materiality of the of the letters and the complexity of, for example, why were these letters having bridges? So this is actually lead; it's physical. So I was completely amazed. And then we had these plastic letters going on, and then we had this huge, oh come on, uh, filled with with bugs and falling wood letters. Um, and actually, why were these cartons in the back? I will. I later learned this stuff, but back then I was, why, why haven't I learned about this? Why, why do I only learn computer, and why? Because in Portuguese, when I learned, we said, for example, when we when we were setting type, people always said, oh, just set the leading to the a bit higher, and when I when I read stuff and when I heard people saying leading, I was like, what? That's not the way to say it, and. And then I learned that this, this came from this technology. So I started learning about history and I started learning about how people did this back in the day because I, and I, have ne I had never seen it being done in a, in, a, in a composing room. And well, I fell in love with it. But by the end of our course, we didn't have access to anything because our printing museum is not really a live museum. So you can go there. Sometimes there are some workshops on binding. You can actually use a manual proof press to, to test it, but you don't have access, for example, to a full to a full uh, cabinet, to a full uh, uh, type cabinet. Uh, so our students don't really have access to this. This has changed in the last years. For example, from here, from my house, I can see uh, EZAD, it's a, it's a higher education school. They are starting to put together, they, they, they're not starting, they have put together a full working typography workshop that works in a hybrid way. They have the vendor cook, the Heidelberg, the metal proofing press, but then they have uh, 3D printers, they have laser cutters, they have a risograph printer. So they work in this uh, full process. So you, you can actually produce a hybrid booklet with old technologies, with new technologies. And, and I think this is fun. So knowing about what the technology, how can I say this? When working with computers, I was aware that was a previous technology that gave birth to it. So I was curious about it. So gradually after finishing my course and starting to trying to find this out, I started to find out more people interested and I started to find workshops and I started to find material. And of course I had to have a job to earn money to buy this stuff because yes. this is really expensive. Uh, but yeah, um, but now we have some studios, some workshops that are willing to welcome people and let them try. So it, this is the really interesting part of it. So I don't know. And I have a different perspective. For example, me and my wife, my wife is an illustrator and I always make fun of this because whenever I see these letters, I don't know, these shapes or, and when I'm setting, I'm, I'm thinking math, maybe because I do web and I do programming and I'm trying to do the multiples and I'm trying to fit, copy fit the, the texts uh, to get it uh, centered or justified. And when Marta sees it and she says, oh, it's a dog. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's 10 lines. It's, it's <laughs> So um, maybe there are ways to get into this technology, to get to fall in love with this. Maybe it's the engravings that you like. Maybe it's just printing white spaces and the textures or the ink. So I think there's something for everyone to fall in love with it. And if you, I don't know, maybe for the uh, enthusiasts or students that are out there, if you're afraid of the ink or something, there are ways to do this with uh, water-based ink, with non-toxic ink, with soy-based ink, 
Of course, I prefer the oil-based ink and the smelly ink that doesn't leave your, your fingers for three or four days. But yeah, it, you don't have to be scared with it. Maybe you can do it. Oh, I had this. This is my... I'm trying to follow the footsteps of, of Richard Kegler and Amelia. And I'm actually 3D printing in, at home this small uh, pattern, pattern shapes to produce... Okay. To produce something that maybe I can show it to you. Uh, oh, come on, it's downstairs. Well, yeah, uh, yeah. 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 pattern print. By the time that Udaya is presenting, you can definitely run back and bring it for sure. Uh, okay. I yeah. have a lot of questions myself, um, but uh, since we're running short of time, I'm going to um, ask uh, Professor there to uh, start on the presentation and so uh, uh, just uh, Pedro be there we will be uh, connecting back after uh, the last speaker we have a lot I'm sure the audience will have a lot of questions thank you and over to you uh, professor Udair thank you for your time so I'm. I would like to, uh, while Professor Udaya sets up his uh, screen, I will give a quick introduction on uh, who uh, this uh, amazing person is. So he's a, one of the most uh, incredible and most humble people I've ever met, uh, and um, so he's the associate professor and the head in the department of design, IIT Guwahati. Uh, so what? actually impressed me was the fact that he he is the designer of the rupee symbol in india so that's a big deal and uh, and i'm really proud to uh, introduce this really nice individual to to the audience and among uh, about udaya among his achievements he is um, his body of work actually includes a wide variety of projects in identity design, poster design, brochure design, book covers, and so on. So, without further ado, I would give the floor to uh, Udaya. Yeah. Okay. Udaya, is your speaker on? Um, Yeah, Udev, we cannot hear you. Uh, we can see your screen though. Is the mic on, Udev? There's an error coming there. Yeah, it was working. There? Professor there? Okay. I have a question for Patriot. Okay. Uh, so. Okay, so I, I believe till Udaya, uh, Professor Udaya sets up, um, there is a question that has come up uh, for Pedro. Um, Pedro, the question is, um, uh, have you tried a small, have you tr uh, Tried. This is coming from Darshan. Uh, asking, um, have you tried a small letter? If yes, what is the most minimum uh, millimeters uh, that you can achieve? <laughs> uh, uh, oh, well, in in three D printing or using type, in, in printing uh, it, uh, yeah. creating it. I believe it should be. Uh, yeah, uh, fabricating the letter. Yeah, we will just uh, take uh, most probably fabricating. We'll take it from there yeah. and yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I've actually um, I, I don't have here the test prints. It can actually produce really, really, really small letters. Uh, 
because this is uh, a kind of printer, it's called stereolithography. So it's, it's the new generation of resin-based printers, 3D-based printers. So it's not filament printer. It's not the printer that extrudes plastic. It's the printer that pulls out a shape from, uh, it's like a, 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 yeah, well, you can search for it on, online. It's like resin, 3D resin printers. They're really small. Well, they, they can be bigger now. Um, at affordable printers because you have professional printers. It's called uh, stereolithography, um, digital stereolithography, and um, it can produce really, really small. I don't, I didn't measure it, but it, I, I think it, it could be like a, a cap height, so a, may a majuscule of, of around two and a half, three millimeters, legible with detail. So this this printer has a precision of zero point five millimeters, I think, or zero point zero five. I don't remember. <laughs> so it's really it's really cool. <laughs> so it's it's really usable. And uh, our issue with it, because this material, this is a failed print, so this everything got got on the same height. So it's really it's really strong. Um, and the only the only problem is that this material shrinks. So if you get it on type high, you have to account for the shrinkage. In my case, it was two percent, so it was really simple. It, I just did a test and then enlarge it accordingly so it was really and it's really really detailed you have really really sharp corners and really sharp detail ar around three millimeters it's okay but i don't think you want to use this with this kind of of, of small detail okay. maybe you want to do photopolymer or something oh, got it so what about the uh, the smudge the yeah. print when the impression how do you can you I'm hear sorry. it in my phone Yes, so there. Sorry, one second, Pedro. We can hear you there. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Cool. I, actually, my system crashed. I just uh, tried to connect an alternative uh, from my iPad. So, okay. uh, am I audible? Yeah. Yes, you are definitely audible. Thank you. Pedro, we're going to come back to you on this. And yeah, uh, yeah Professor, you can actually uh, share screen. I think we should be okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I have to now uh, figure out whether i have that presentation in my ipad so it's, uh, okay just to give me a moment we may not even take the questions with pedro till then. Okay. Okay. <laughs> right. i'm really sorry about this glitch no worries oh we can actually go to joe if joe is ready we we can go ahead with the joe's presentation yeah okay yeah. <clears throat> it's okay so for me, no worries. Yes. Oh, thank you, Joe. Uh, so, uh, to the audience who've, um, who's been waiting to hear from uh, Udaya, we'll have to hold on till he jo joins in. But no, I, please. Yeah. And I am definitely happy uh, to introduce our second speaker for the evening. Uh, so, he's, he's very interesting because he's from the other end of the globe and doing research. Uh, completely to the opposite uh, uh, end. So, uh, not Joe, he's an independent Belgium decisive designer and a researcher. He's elected as a Taipei board member and a Taipei country delegate for Belgium. Uh, he currently teaches in many campuses, uh, universities and institutes, and he, um, he has his own studio. Uh, he's found, uh, his name is Studio Thai. In 2012, he started this, and uh, he's uh, with with this work. He's collaborating with a lot of other Thai agencies. So we are really happy and proud to have you, Joe, on board. And we're quite excited to uh, hear what you got to say. Over to you, Joe. Okay, thank you very much, Sumantri. Um, for inviting me to this uh, online discussion and especially the um, the content of uh, the, the event of this evening, learning from type history. Um, it's a pleasure and an honor to be speaking here as well and to being invited. And it's great to hear uh, the other speakers as well. Um, but I'll be talking about uh, today is briefly giving a general um, overview of some of the work that I've been doing um, and actually come up with a, a kind of an, um, show you an approach of what I'm doing to design typefaces for scripts that are not that much used in the world in terms of like the numbers of users. Um, so in that sense, it means uh, that typefaces for these languages uh, or writing systems I have to speak 
um, are very scarce, um, and it's not that easy to find access to material or to archives uh, and to find uh, sources uh, for um, the history of the printing tradition uh, in terms of um, printing with uh, movable type for these typefaces or writing systems. So to be short, I'll be speaking about three different uh, writing uh, systems that I'm working on uh, in my research and also in my type design projects, apart from uh, the Latin um, designs that I do for uh, Belgian or other um, international projects. Um, and the main uh, studies of my uh, research, whether it's the PhD I've been doing at Reading uh, or the postdoctoral uh, degree, um, but also uh, some other uh, projects that I've been taking on personally uh, will be um, Tibetan scripts, which you can see here. Uh, it's a writing system that's written um, or carved in stone from uh, left to right. Um, and also horizontally, it goes vertically with um, we have making conjunct. So you can see some of the... Um, environments in which uh, the script has been used and is still being used today, like uh, engravings in a stone, but also woodblock printing. And as I, as I was mentioning, the script is written left to right and horizontal uh, and vertical at the same time to provide conjuncts um, um, for the different syllables and sounds uh, that can be produced. Um, Excuse me. The second one uh, is Balinese and Javanese, which are the writing systems um, that are being used in Indonesia, um, apart from the Arabic script as well. But I'll be focusing on uh, Javanese and Balinese. And here you can see some of uh, the scripts being in use, uh, mainly in this case, um, in environments which have like more of an artistic and historical um, sighting to it. Um, and the third one will be Mongolian, uh, which is written vertically from top to bottom, left to right. Um, the difference with the other writing systems that I'll be talking about is that Mongolian is actually a connecting script. So each character is joined to the one that follows uh, or predecessor it. Um, so each of the characters need to be designed um, yeah, in three to four different uh, shapes uh, to be able to be used. Now, uh, here you can see a writing manual, um, but the research that I'm doing uh, is mainly collecting samples of um, printing types um, uh, that have been used throughout the years and mainly from uh, the very first uh, printing type that has been used and of, or been developed for each of the writing systems up to recent technologies. Um, and usually it's in order to find an approach to actually design typefaces today. And um, what I'm doing or collecting in each of this, um, the samples that I'm studying is not only collecting uh, samples, like preferably original type specimen books or original printing uh, works that have been printed with uh, the original sorts. And then I'll try, I'm trying to analyze them uh, in the way of uh, the visual characteristics in terms of zooming in, trying to find identifications, but also trying to relocate and uh, collect and share the information of uh, the existing type material that's still um, being found or being stored um, in type archives or libraries or museums um, or you name it archives um, as preservation. And that's not um, always easily accessible to many people. So the more information you can find and study and collect from these sort of collections and the more you can share it to uh, the community and also people, uh, not only type historians, but also type designers and um, people who are into the font engineering, I find the better because sometimes it's quite secluded to get access to or if it's just stored in private collections, which uh, we don't easily find. Um, so here you can see some of the early punches from uh, a Manchu um, typeface, which is also a sort, uh, a style of the Mongolian script. 
uh, some details of how these uh, shapes or conjuncts or syllables can be formed. So it's not only like pun uh, creating punctions as an individual design, but sometimes to uh, cast a matrix, two or three punctions are combined and connected with a, a, um, a piece of cord to actually make the matrix itself. Um, then in other places here, you can see some of the uh, Mongolian matrices from the collection of in Italy, in Parma. The previous one uh, was from Paris. Um, here you can see some of the uh, similar kind of um, um, way of making the matrices uh, or casting the matrices um, again in the collection of the Imprimerie uh, Nationale in France. Um, in Germany, there is another kind of large collection which houses a lot of um, matrices matrices in general from many um, writing systems of the world uh, because they had a collection of large printing houses which were printing in many languages uh, and not only in German at the time. But also Oxford um, has kind of a large collection of um, the writing systems that I've been focusing on. So here you can see um, a different way of a smaller Tibetan um, typeface. Um, of course, it's not just taking photographs or collecting or finding um, documentation on who was a punch cutter, why was it designed, um, what was the first publication. Um, it's also comparing them and also trying to um, find um, reactions in, I have to say, or maybe impressions from people who would be reading or using it today because there is a large tradition um, and lots have been written already on the evolution of Western typography, but unfortunately not much is known on um, the individual printing uh, evolution of each of the um, writing systems that I've been uh, working on. And then it's, it's kind of um, very useful to go through original uh, material, like uh, here is a type specimen book from um, a printing house of the Academy of Sciences in St. Petersburg. And once in a while you can see some information about how many individual characters were designed or combination of characters. In this case, uh, on the image you see here, um, it's all the individual sorts which have some in, um, individual characters, but also some combinations of characters which are easy to be uh, used by the typesetter who was uh, typesetting the pages of the font rather than making like um, yeah, a kind of a mosaic scheme of the page itself. But I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, unfortunately, um, most of the writing systems that I've been investigating and studying, the production of metal type has not been um, executed or done in the original countries. And lots of the material is indeed in uh, Western countries, uh, many European, but also Russian um, archives. And um, having said that, it means that lots of the information that can be found on the production or the origins of these uh, early typefaces or printing types is also written in their original um, uh, uh, language of the printing house. So in this case, you can see a printing type from one of the earliest um, Javanese typefaces, which were actually um, cut and cast uh, in Enschede in the Netherlands, uh, mm -hmm. sorry, yeah, in Haarlem uh, by uh, Johan Enschede and Zonen. But um, the explanation uh, on uh, the execution, the manufacturer who did it, was all written in French and in Dutch itself, so not in the uh, Javanese language. Um, so I find it also a very good opportunity to find these um, um, materials, also translated into English and preferably have it translated for um, the people who are reading the uh, native language, of course, because most of these can't read the, um, the original uh, texts and vice versa, um, because not much has been written uh, on, for instance, a bit on Javanese, but lesser in 
Tibetan uh, printing history or in Mongolian printing history. And their original uh, findings are not translated into English as well. So I find it a very good opportunity to, to actually um, collect all the information, share it and, and, and connect it with, with one another as well. Um, this same printing uh, proof that I showed you from uh, the Javanese also gives an other approach of designing the uh, um, character sets or the individual sorts of the Javanese. So it's a very useful um, way of uh, imperial research to actually uh, comparing uh, the different approaches to how the individual metal types are being cast and cut uh, and typesets. Um, I'm not talking about and this talk about the quality of the fonts because, as you can notice, um, well, some of you who might follow uh, via the YouTube uh, channel uh, will see that some of the earlier types are really not of the, the, the good quality um, because they were interpretation of some of the original writing systems. Sometimes it was also like to be um, used in connection with uh, Latin typefaces. So, the quality is, is questionable. Uh, over the years, it improved as well, but um, only by trial and error and by use uh, of it as well. Um, but here is, like for instance, an original collection of the punches um, at the archives of the Johan Enschede Museum. Um, and again, uh, at that time, very fortunate to be given access to the private collection because at that time the museum was um, part of a private um, firm um, and it was not easy to get access to it. You have to ask, get an invitation. There is no um, catalog where you can search anything. Um, but luckily, part of the big collection of this um, important uh, printing firm has now become uh, part of an international archive of the Netherlands. So the whole collection is moved and people are making it more accessible to a general audience. So in that case, things are improving for some of the archives, some of the collections to give things more uh, access and also to, um, in a sense, to digitize some of the work. So some of the photos that have been taken, but also other researchers uh, or designers have been taken are being made available on. It's not just like an a small piece of uh, collection that no, no one can use. Um, again, making like a collection, trying to make a uh, kind of a conspectus, like a collection of all the uh, examples and studied typefaces. You can find a, see a smaller version, a different way of engraving um, uh, this original source material for um, a Javanese typeface. <laughs> Um, with, again, different ways of typesetting tools. Uh, but on the other hand, um, if you dig any deeper in some of the material, you can also find some original sources, like in this case, the signature of the original um, engraver. In this case, I have to say it was not a punch cutter, but an engraver. Uh, well, he was a punch cutter as well, but in this case, it was an engraving of this Javanese double Bessinian. Um, and if you read in mirror script, you can see that Schmidtlin is actually the executor. So these are also extra information that you can find uh, in, in this kind of original uh, material of printing uh, material. Um, it's not always useful to look at the printing sources. So in that sense, I mentioned, I tried to collect as many type uh, specimens or original type specimens or printing of the, uh, the printing types that I'm, I'm studying. Um, but in this case, a printed page cannot always indicate how it was being made uh, or printed. And as we might usual think in early printing types, first the punch was cut, then the matrix, matrix was uh, struck. But in this case, um, of this gefigureerd or the very embellished or ornamented Javanese, um, it was actually an engraving uh, from a very small plate. And unfortunately, here you can see part of a text uh, that has been um, engraved and printed. But there's only, as you can see from this image, two, four, six, eight, nine, if I'm not mistaken, no, sorry, ten individual plates left of this engraving. So all the others have been lost. 
Uh, but what's striking from this specific uh, example is that um, the engraver who did this very detailed and very impressive work of engraving like the refined uh, curvature, the um, refined um, embellishments of this decorated typeface uh, or display Javanese um, was um, uh, Gottlieb Schlegelmilk and he was only 16 years old at the time of this uh, engraving. So um it's also if you dig into the archive and the correspondence that if it's preserved um is is available you can find a lot out uh, uh, you can find out a lot of um, extra useful information uh, that uh, shows um or gives extra meaning to uh, the making of it um here i did some um showing that he um actually had to engrave everything like a punch cutter in mirror script um, and you can see then how parts of these uh, Japanese characters because it's part of like uh, uh, a conject uh, is shown or a big larger one um, and of course like going into this archive you can also see that um, some other uh, important um, elements come to the light so here you can see some original uh, packing of some of the punches of this Javanese and which was actually engraved by Paul Ratish. He was an in-house uh, punch cutter and engraver um, at the NCD and he actually cut most of the typefaces for Jan van Krimpen. So in this case you can see that he was also um, yeah, had to do the work um, of making engravings from other printing types uh, modeled on some initial drawings or models from other. In this case, I don't know if it was an original uh, Indonesian who actually sent the Javanese um, models of this typeface, but um, he was actually executing um, the, this, uh, the cutting work for or the engraving work uh, for the designs itself. Also, the type specimens can give a lot of information on how it's used, what kind of texts were being printed, how many sorts were printed, how much it costs uh, to be sold um, and to the printing houses. But what is also more important is actually uh, that uh, the material and these printing types can give you information on um, yeah, the case lace or uh, the type cases, how they will be used and not. So, if I'm lucky to find original type cases, um, and in the case of the Tibetan, I was um, very happy that I, I was given chance to work with uh, typefaces that were originating from the British Library in London and also from uh, the St. Bright Library in London. And I was able to actually, unfortunately, not all of the type cases were uh, in order, so they were like mixed, so I had to sort them again. Uh, prepare them again to find the case lay, but I was given the uh, the opportunity to actually typeset a printing type specimen with it to find out how these printing types were actually being uh, typeset. You can see one typeface by uh, Teinhardt from Germany, who printed quite a popular Tibetan typeface in combination on top with um, another uh, Tibetan typeface or printing type that was manufactured in uh, England, in the UK, but he would, that uses a different method of typesetting, um, of composing the different uh, metal type. Um, I've explained it all in a type specimen and in uh, the actual um, research that I did. And um, during the research, I was able to meet quite a lot of other uh, type historians printing uh, archivists as well and um, in one of the sheds of a private um, uh, press uh, in um, the Netherlands um, I found an original or, or there was an original uh, case or two cases of Mongolian itself so I also was given the opportunity to actually work with the original um, metal type um, that was manufactured uh, by Brill um, for the Mongolian type so Again, I had to um, find out how uh, the, the type cases were used, how the printing uh, sorts had to be typeset, um, and I could actually typeset uh, a text in the Mongolian script, but it, it's actually a language uh, or text that is here, like a poem. 
Um, and I could work with also Manchurists from the University of Leiden who actually proofread the text uh, because it's an historical uh, document. And Manchu, unfortunately, is at the moment no longer uh, in, in everyday use. So it's not that many uh, people um, who can actually read um, Manchu. Uh, so I was able and lucky again to actually print with the original uh, printing sorts from uh, the Leiden um, uh, typeface. Um, but it gives an, a kind of an information to how the, ty the, the printing types are set and the typefaces are set. Uh, and that might be useful to designing um, and also engineering the digital fonts of today. Because the, face, uh, the page that you can see here from part of my research is a page from a dictionary which is uh, written in Mongolian, uh, which is vertical, uh, but also in Russian, in Tibetan, and also in French. And the four writing systems, which you can see here, um, are completely typeset differently. And nowadays, it's very hard, it's even quite complicated to find um, software, like a word processor or typesetters, and also well-functioning digital fonts that actually can produce the same page layout as you can see from this um, 1844 um, documents um, from, um, from Russia. So it's quite an achievement then, and it's still quite uh, a challenge to do it today. Um, other information which is essential is actually not uh, for designing uh, today uh, digital fonts, which are contemporary, is also to find ways of how um, the writing systems with more characters than uh, the standard uh, Latin character set can be actually typeset uh, or keyed in on a, on a keyboard. And when I was visiting Mongolia uh, um, to do my research on a Mongolian writing system, I was lucky to be part uh, to be taken to the archive of the National Library, and also um, see and, and use the Mongolian write, typewriter uh, to see how it's actually typeset with this very standard um, uh, keyboard uh, as well. Here you can see some of the pages, and you can already, although that most of you might not immediately be familiar with the script, but you can already detect some characteristics of typewriter fonts, which also are characteristics for uh, not only for Latin typefaces, but also for, in this case, Mongolian, because of the impression uh, of the keys, which have to be struck inside of an inked ribbon. There is, the refinement is much different than, for instance, typefaces uh, that are used for um, uh, body text or even refined display type. So there is already some uh, thing to say here. For the Javanese or Balinese script, um, I also am, am in contact with locals. Uh, the same goes with uh, Mongolian xylographers, uh, like a collection of xylographic woodblocks. Um, also uh, Mongolian uh, calligraphers, but also um, historians of today. Um, because one thing is needed that is to find the uh, information about the history of the printing types, but also to see how uh, the writing uh, of the individual writing system can be implemented in a digital typeface of today. I was lucky to be, to be um, invited at the home of uh, Professor Chona, whom you can see here in the middle, who is like a very important uh, linguist and also professor um, who actually taught uh, the Mongolian uh, people in Ulaanbaatar how to rewrite and reread their writing system on uh, via uh, sessions on uh, national television. Um, I'll come back to this in a moment. Um, but also other people uh, were quite important in their um, uh, studies and research that I was able to undertake for uh, the, uh, the Mongolian writing system. Uh, because each of them have their connection with um, their tradition and their aspect of uh, the Mongolian um, scripts and also producing digital fonts. Also contemporary calligraphers who do more, um, how should I say, expressive work and also very young, like very, how should I say, um, uh, trendy and, and hip um, graffiti 
uh, tigers. They also have some new ways of interpreting uh, the traditional Mongolian writing system because for a long time they had to use Cyrillic uh, instead of the traditional Mongolian writing system to write Mongolian. Um, and you can see like a kind of a revival now and um, re in, uh, how should I say this, um, an, an engagement in expression, uh, different ways of um, interpretation in these writing systems. And they also both um, ways help me in finding this kind of uh, suggestions or approaches uh, for implementing these kind of um, interactions into uh, contemporary fonts. For all these writing systems, I mentioned there is already some difficulties in finding um, information of ways, uh, um, whether it be in their original uh, tongue or in English. Um, and it's and it's not always easy to communicate about um, uh, finding terminology of, or typography uh, terminology for the writing systems because of um, yeah, the lack of, uh, of, of uh, information. And in this case, for finding ways how to name uh, the anatomy of each of the Tibetan uh, characters, I was able to find a woodblock printing from uh, Tibetan scribes. And they actually describe everything um, as being part of um, um, yeah, the anatomy of an animal or um, an, a human body, which is very beautiful and poetic. And I very much like it's, uh, um, how they actually see uh, connections in the shaping and the curvature uh, in nature. Um, but in terms of communicating um, a more general approach in, in finding ways of talking about the shaping of the characters, um, um, I came up together with, again, also in this case, Tibetans and also um, uh, inhabitants of Bhutan, uh, to up with the general naming of the individual strokes uh, and stems. Um, it's easier to, in a, in a sense, use a kind of typographic approach because in the beginning I was writing emails or talking about people, about the characters, and they thought I was dissecting an animal or doing some surgery, So, which is, again, nice and beautiful as well. But coming up with like a general kind of um, an, um, uh, naming is, is an easier way to communicate. The same goes for Mongolian. Um, there's lots been written in, in this case, uh, modern Mongolian or Cyrillic, uh, but also in um, traditional uh, Mongolian writing system. Um, and it's quite of easy to do this. Um, the aim of all, all this research is actually to come up with a collection of the individual printing types, which have been um, designed chronologically. So in this case, uh, you can see an, um, a list um, with the original um, sizing of uh, Javanese typefaces that were designed in Enschede in the Netherlands. And the same goes for uh, the overview of the um, early or historical uh, Javanese typefaces that were designed at the competitor um, type foundry in the Netherlands, which was um, uh, Lettergieterij Amsterdam, uh, previously known as Tetterode, uh, which had uh, some different uh, approaches. For the Tibetan, uh, as well as for the other uh, scripts, it's I prefer to also present to each of the users or the readers of the research and some easy, um, an overview in, in easy charts, uh, so you can see the evolution, also the exact type size, uh, also, you can see in a blink the how how I how some of the shapes are have evolved um, from the beginning to nowadays, and I think it's also quite useful to have, uh, which I've called, I've created for each of these uh, three writing systems, kind of a database which lists uh, not only when the typeface was designed, who designed it as well, what is the first publication that was printed. Um, how was it distributed to uh, the rest of the world, um, in a sense, because some of the type foundries uh, actually produced um, type on different height to be sent out in each different directions. And it's quite surprising to see how one specific typeface traveled all around the world and has been used even nowadays in a more uh, digital way. Um, but it also shows like um, the different originators 
Live streaming is on. Okay, thank you. I I'm almost finishing, so it's it's almost um, talk is almost coming to an end. Um, but I go back to one of the pages of uh, the database, in this case of the Mongolian typefaces that I've been studying and collecting, um, which are presented as actually uh, uh, yeah, an overview. Um, also, I think it's important um, to make it more visible, not just for the researcher, but also to a wider audience. So the web, uh, in this case, for the Mongolian script, I kept a blog from uh, like a website blog from when I was undertaking um, the research during the trip. Um, there is more to come on the website, but also in different ways of like an, an, a new publication of uh, the Mongolian work. Um, but I find that it's, yeah, it's not, it's essential to share the information. Um, and I think it's, I think it's a good approach, especially nowadays when things um, are becoming more and more available to wider audience to actually share it um, and I'm lucky uh, to say that a few weeks ago my book publication on Tibetan typeforms which is based on the PhD research that I um, did but continued on um, throughout the years has been published by Uitgeverij de Buitenkant um, so that's an other way of finally um, showing to the world actually the kind of work and, and the overview of all uh, um, yeah, the, the research and work and, and comparisons that went into this part. Um, apart from um, these typeface designs uh, of the different writing systems, um, I also have a collection of Mongolian newspapers, which is quite um, also um, unique to find. Uh, and there's another study that goes into like the design of Mongolian um, newspapers and the use of their typefaces, but that's been sidetracked. That's a Tibetan uh, publication. But the aim actually to do uh, all this kind of research is for me to actually try to preserve endangered, endangered writing systems and their literature through typeface design. And of course, a single person is unable to do this. So I really think that it's necessary for more people to engage um, in designing writing uh, typefaces for writing systems that might be lost or that might be endangered or that although that is only like a small percentage of the world population that uses uh, the, the language, um, I find it necessary that each of these writing systems also have like a large number of fonts or typefaces to be used in their literature um, because unfortunately and I've been already to quite a lot of spaces and libraries all over the world um, even like as I mentioned in the shed of the uh, uh, private press in the Netherlands um, I was able to receive a few type cases but unfortunately quite a lot have been damaged through the uh, because of the damp and, and, and the moisture that was in the printing uh, press but lots of the archives um, that you can see, um, sometimes the literature is lost because of the, the some of the material that has been stored there um, has been damaged through insects to uh, to do with also um, the the climate, and not all of this information has yet been digitized. Some of them might be photographed digitally, but the content is not yet available. So it's really an urge to a lot of people, but also fundraisers to help out with people who seek um, funding um, to actually design um, fonts, but also produce typefaces uh, for these endangered writing systems so that it becomes uh, um, yeah, part of, of uh, the world and the heritage of, of the literature that can be saved. So that's the main goal actually to, to do this research and to open it to a wider audience and to share it as much as possible with everyone. So um, thank you very much for listening. And if you have any questions, please feel free to email me um, at the uh, uh, email below or ask questions at YouTube or contact Sumantri who might put you in contact with me. So thank you very much for listening. Well, thank you, Joe. It was quite interesting.
and uh, you actually took us like way back into history like pedro took us at, at, at one point yeah. and then and here you have taken us to this uh, whole uh, whole era of uh, what had been there and how it needs to be uh, preserved and thank you so much for the work you've been doing and true enough uh, all the data i think uh, what is required or the data that we need in this part of the world is mostly recorded there and as a result um, you know people like you doing such research helps to document and uh, we'll be able to compare and develop this subject area so thank you joe and um, thank you uh, so i am going to open up to uh, we have a question so there is a question for you yes please yes yeah. please ask uh, okay so uh, he says hi joe uh, you being from belgium i am just curious about uh, what initiated or uh, made you interested in mongolian and tibetan type I, I, it's a very good question. I get this, this, this question quite a lot, but um, um, what instigated this is that um, when I was a graphic designer uh, here in, in Brussels, when I, I was a master's student, I was um, always intrigued in uh, visualizing language and sounds. And I'm always from the beginning was interested in how a same word, say hello, for instance, mm -hmm. is written differently in Belgium, Brussels, uh, for instance, in Sri Lanka, but also in Egypt. Um, and it's exactly the same kind of um, yeah, sound uh, and the way that the different interpretations or graphemes were uh, created for each of these writing systems. And uh, in uh, my master uh, graphic design in Brussels, I already studied the uh, characteristics and uh, evolution of the different writing systems of the world. Um, and um, after graduating, I didn't want to go to work as a graphic designer immediately. So I took a um, half a year off and I traveled around India for six months with my backpack. And when I was in India for these six months, I met a lot of people. And thanks to my uh, background and interest in typography and writing systems, um, I took quite a lot of photos. I met with um, um, Indian scribes and, and writers, and I learned some Hindi. Um, and the end of my trip, I actually stayed um, in the Himalayas um, for two months uh, in Dharamsala, where I lived with the Tibetan uh, family. And every single, um, I, I learned, I was giving English uh, to the local uh, Yes, uh, children and, and, and people, Tibetans over there. And in return, they taught me Tibetan. And I was so much intrigued by it that I continued to study the writing system uh, and, uh, and the literature as well. Um, that when I started in Reading, um, and I just went to the University of Reading at the typography department initially to design a type family for uh, Latin typefaces from my background. Uh, but I was given, yeah, the, again, the opportunity to also design an, uh, for another writing system. And I was happy that with my background in Tibetan uh, language and scripts, reading and writing of it, um, together with always working with um, yeah, local Tibetans, or at this time also some Tibetans living here in Belgium, uh, to develop a typeface for that writing system. And thanks to my PhD, which actually evolved from my MA in typeface design in Reading. Um, I was lucky to actually come to several archives and collections in the world. Um, and what I noticed is that the early or the initial um, punch cutters and typeface designers for printing types who were designing typefaces for Tibetan, most of them also started designing typefaces for Mongolian script. Um, so that's why actually during my research for Tibetan, I already started collecting um, material for the Mongolian um, writing system because I had I was there. And at some even nowadays, I don't have access to going back to some of these collections. 
so I know some of them. I, um, of course, I've got some contacts, uh, telephone numbers, and, and um, email addresses of some people. But still, some of the uh, places are so remote and so inaccessible uh, that it's not always easy to collect the material or information. And they gave me permission already to do this. So also for other researchers or for uh, other people who have interest in it, I'm happy to share all this that I've, I've got as, as well. So it's not, uh, that's it. So in that sense, that was a bit of the link uh, from the Tibetan to the Mongolian. And as I noticed, quite a lot of the printed works, but also the manuscripts um, that use Tibetan for Tibetan, but also for uh, Dzongka, which is uh, Bhutan, uh, the language being used in Bhutan. They also had like uh, translations into Mongolian. So there is kind of this um, uh, linguistic collection, uh, sorry, connection of the writing systems that I've been studying. And in re regards to the Javanese, because that's the third one that I'm um, interested in, is mainly because I was actually doing a lot of research in Enschede um, in the Netherlands at the archives. And most of the uh, material or the correspondence of um, the printing types for the Javanese uh, script are in Dutch or in French, that I, again, I started to translating it to English and also collecting um, the material information for there, from there. Uh, so that's a basically in short, I know it's a bit long, but in short, what is the connection between the three, um, yeah, the interests of these three writing systems? Lovely. Thank you, George. So I'm sure you got your answer there and the curiosity begins there. Uh, I'm sure I'm now. Sorry? Sorry. Yeah. So I will open up uh, there to speak, and I'm sure the audience will also for the team. And uh, one is because the Tamil script has uh, been used here, so it comes in as one of our national languages. So we would like to definitely hear your story and uh, how we can learn from you. So over to you, there. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Am I audible? Yes. Oh, thank you. Finally. Yeah, I'm really sorry about this glitch and I'm going to share it. When I share, then everything in the screen goes off. So I hope this time it works. So I'm just going to share and thanks for the introduction, sir. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, sir. There we can see. Yeah, okay. I'm just going to make it full screen. Yep. Just give me a moment and I'll just uh, present it. Yeah, so can you see the screen? Yes, so there we go. Yeah, it's fine. Perfect. Okay, fine. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Sumantri, for this opportunity. And I'm, I also got introduced to uh, other two speakers, Dr. Joe and Dr. Pedro. Uh, I, in fact, I've written to Dr. Pedro during his conference, and we have also applied papers. My, some of my students. Uh, uh, written uh, papers to the, this conference and that way we have got acquainted but it's the first time I'm kind of seeing him in, in, in person I mean of course through online yeah so it's nice to meet uh, both of them and Dr. Joe's very interesting presentation on Tibetan script as uh, it's very fascinating and the amount of uh, collections and images he has is like really uh, uh, it shows uh, so much of hard work and uh, effort has gone in yeah so it, I can relate it because I, I too had gone through such a, a process and so I can see the amount of work that people have done and I really appreciate and I appreciate that they could share it with us. Yeah. So thank you uh, both the speakers yes, for your wonderful presentation. So and thank you Sumatri for making this happen and uh, may bringing me also to be part of this. Yeah. So thanks. So with this I, I would want to start with my own uh, presentation. and. Uh, uh, actually, this is part of my own PhD and uh, this is one segment of my PhD where I kind of worked on Tamil typography. I looked at the, the printing in India and especially from Tamil. Uh, so I'm from Tamil Nadu, uh, a small state in uh, India. So of course, I, I over when I go through the slides, I'll just kind of tell you. Uh, so uh, a printing uh, happened in India just happened 100 years. The Gutenberg invented this mobile type printing. So first, uh, first time it came in 1556. Uh, so when I did my PhD, I, I, I had a very tough time trying to find resources in Indian printing and uh, and especially in Tamil. And I could hardly find any material. And there were very few books which which had uh, uh, 
uh, about uh, information about printing yeah so so i've listed the, all of those people uh, in, in my second uh, sentence yeah so like anand kaka pirolkar uh, k7 sambandham start blackburn tamil nadu and, and so a um, few more others and these were about the major source for my uh, research and i'm thankful to all of these pioneers who kind of painstakingly uh, uh, help document our history and uh, preserve the history through their own uh, writings and research and documentations and just because of that i could i was possible to kind of do my own research and take it forward and understand how uh, printing has actually happened in india and now of course there's quite a few informations available uh, uh, yeah so my research was basically uh, was on tamil typography looking at tamil printing how it has actually evolved over a time uh, since its beginning so not like i said not much of resource was available at that time so uh, yeah so uh, and uh, to speak about tamil so you can see the map in the map india map so we are one of the southern states four southern states uh, and we uh, speak tamil and uh, there there are quite a few uh, other countries which also have tamil as their official language like singapore malaysia and sri lanka yeah so uh, and of course there are even in the different parts of the world also there are tamil speaking people and they use tamil script uh, so tamil is one of the oldest languages uh, maybe i will not go in, in detail to it it, it spans uh, from 300 bc and if you look at the indian languages tamil is also considered as a classical language yeah one of the first language to be uh, kind of given this uh, status of classical language and one good thing about tamil is that the grammar and the grammatical structure which was uh, spoken in the earlier in the ancient times is still continues to be the same yeah the script and uh, those script forms have changed slightly but the grammar the literature everything uh, more or less have kind of continued uh, since for uh, 2000 years yeah. uh, so this is to, just to give you an idea of the evolution of different south indian scripts uh, so india is a diverse country uh, uh, so it has too many languages too many scripts too many dialects our thousands and thousands of dialects are there in our country and the, the place where i stay i stay in uh, northeastern uh, india with, with uh, seven states uh, so more in a hilly region and they have uh, may, uh, thousands of tribes here yeah in assam meghalaya nagaland and so on so i am far away from my home but which is in south yeah so this you can see uh, if you look at the indian scripts so the mother of all scripts is the brahmi scripts and from that many scripts have come even the southeast asian scripts have all have uh, evolved through the brahmi scripts and in, in my research i'm mostly going to focus though i i've covered the north uh, northern brahmi and north indian scripts but i'm trying to mostly focus on the tamil aspect of it so that's why i kind of uh, give um uh, this chart kind of shows the evolution of south indian scripts that there are four major south indian scripts which is tamil malayalam kannada and telugu at different states in southern india and if you look at tamil it actually emerged in 7th century ad uh, during the chola reign and it was popular during the chola dynasty uh, uh, so there were three great kings we had and uh, chola is one of the major uh, dynasty and it is during that period uh, it kind of flourished and it kind of emerged as a full fleshed uh, script yeah from tamil brahmi uh vatartha is uh, actually basically the malayalam so from where uh, the present current day malayalam script evolves yeah it's vatartha it's called vatartha because vatam means a circle and artha means letters so if you look at the letters that the malayalam scripts they are all circular in nature yeah that's because of the the form, visual form of the script itself yeah so so the uh, tamil is a combination of vatartha and the grantha is another prominent script which is used for writing scran sanskrit a language yeah uh, in ancient language uh, there are lot of teachers are there yeah so so that that is a beast uh, or just a, a glimpse of uh, the evolution and here you can see the uh, actual script so in fact in comparison to most of the indian scripts uh, tamil has the least number of glyphs when i say leaves number of leaves it has only 247 letters as compared to devanagari which has more than 800 900 letters yeah including the conjugations and vowel consonants and uh, various diacritic marks but tamil is one of the simplest in terms of the script is concerned yeah and, uh, and one of the oldest language and uh, though i can i uh, wish i could show the the evolution of all the other scripts in a, in a chart but yeah so time is short so i can put it just the tamil script so we have to all 12 vowels 18 consonants and vowel consonants which is basically a combination of the vowel and 
uh, consonant. And we also borrowed a uh, few letters from Grantha script, the Sanskrit, which is shown at the end. Yeah, we have six letters. It is the J, H, S, Sh, Sh, and Sri, yeah, which was not originally part of the Tamil script, but it, but we still use them in the current day use. Yeah, so we kind of uh, taken because there are certain pronunciation in Tamil we don't have. Yeah, we don't have letters for certain pronunciation, just like the English language. Yeah, so you you don't have certain letters for uh, uh, pronouncing certain sound sound forms. Yeah, so in that sense. So we have kind of borrowed it from Granda. Uh, so these kind of six letters, loan letters. Uh, uh, so if you look at the printing, so it all started with Vasco da Gama uh, when he uh, kind of discovered the sea route to uh, India. And from then on, we had a lot of many uh, Christian missionaries started to come into our country. And, and then that's kind of started uh, the entire uh, uh, printing and so on. As you know, we we are India is a country which has been colonized by many European countries. Yeah, so from time to time, and British were one of the uh, the largest imperial uh, kingdom, which kind of had a major role and for a long duration. Yeah, we were under British rule. Yeah, so yeah, so the Vasco da Gama Sea Route kind of kind of established this pathway where the people started to come in. And one of the first things the missionaries did was they kind of tried to learn the native language. At that time, it was like all Kind of a southern India, where uh, they first kind of landed in uh, Calicut, which was at the time the, there was no distinction as Kerala state, uh, Andhra Pradesh, uh, or uh, Karnataka, or Tamil Nadu. So there are different states now. We have about 27 states and so on. So at that point of time, there was not states because it, they were all kingdoms, and so Tamil was more prevalent in the southern part of the India. So. And they try to learn Tamil and then uh, try to kind of preach uh, Christian uh, Christianity. And they find it. And uh, at that point of time, the uh, the local medium of instruction was the palm leaf manuscripts. Yeah. So just like how uh, uh, Dr. Joe has uh, showed us the Tibetan manuscripts, so we uh, we used to write in palm leaf manuscripts. That was our traditional medium of writing system. Uh, we also, of course, had uh, metal inscriptions and uh, stone inscription, in, inscriptions. My research was primarily focused on the palm leaf manuscript. Though I'm not going to talk about palm leaf manuscript at this point in this presentation. So this was the uh, the major use, uh, major medium that was being employed. Yeah. So and uh, the missionaries felt very difficult to kind of adapt to this this kind of a medium. So then they kind of resorted to the letters uh, printing, which was prevalent at that point of time in the Europe, and they wanted to bring that to the uh, Indian context. So and. Uh, if you look at the history of printing, uh, so in fact, Tamil was one of the first Indian languages to be even printed in a foreign soil. Yeah? So it was printed in 1554 in Lisbon, so so to speak, in Portugal. So so there was the first book, uh, uh, Luso Tamil Catechism, which is was printed in Lisbon, Portugal in 1554. And before even the printing came to India, yeah. so the two years later, only printing actually came to India. But before that also, the, the there were books printed and this was one of the first book and it was Printed in bilingual, though there is no copy of it existing. I tried of tried searching for it. Hopefully, I heard that there, the Lisbon Library has some kind of uh, a print material with, with, with the Indian scripts, especially the Tamil books. Yeah, one of the oldest books that's printed in Lisbon. But I did not have an opportunity to go there or uh, find any resources on the online. Yeah, maybe I can take help of Dr. Pedro if it's possible. Yeah, sometimes I can go there and. Uh, uh, have a look at the specimens, if at all, this available in any of the museums. So, so this was the first book, and it was printed in two colors. It was about a 16 pages uh, book, uh, and then the so uh, uh, till then the printing was happening there, and they try they used to kind of bring those printed materials to India, and to then they start they would start preaching, and uh, and and there was this. It's an interesting story that how actually printing came to India after in 1556 actually printer landed in Goa. Uh, by an accident, the print was actually was supposed to go to Abyssinia, East Africa, and since their political situation was not so conducive there, and uh, they did not uh, uh, continue with the journey, so they kind of diverted and they came to India and they landed in Goa, and that's how the printing press actually came. And the press was not in use for an about a an year, and nobody because nobody knew how to operate. the The father who who knew about the printing techniques, who who knew about printing. Uh, was suffering from uh, fever and uh, he kind of uh, was not well uh, and uh, so printing could never happen. Uh, and in, in 1577, uh, uh, later on, 
Only then you can could kind of find an example of a book printed, which is Doctrina Christian by a father called Hendrik Hendrikas. He is kind of considered to be one of the pioneers in the Indian printing. Uh, he was the first to kind of get the printing started in, in our country. And the first book was printed again in 1577 at Goa uh, with, the, with that particular press. And unfortunately, again, there is no copy of it exists uh, now to kind of have a look at it. And, uh, and since then, there was the increase in uh, various printing presses in different locations. Here, it kind of shows a very clear timeline of how printing uh, kind of spread, uh, all because of the Portuguese missionaries. Yeah, and it, it kind of started with uh, 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 Koilan, then Cochin, then it went to uh, Punekel and Ambal Ambalkar. Yeah. So, uh, and the uh, second book was uh, printed in 1578, uh, one year later, again by Hendrik uh, Hendrikas. And it was a translation of uh, St. Xavier's Worship of the Lord. And fortunately, we could get to see a couple of facsimiles of this uh, particular book, which I'll kind of show you in the next uh, slide. And the, uh, all the titles, this is the cover page and this is one of the inside pages of that particular book which was printed in Koilan. And uh, if you look at the typefaces, uh, most of these are kind of inspired uh, by the manuscripts which was existing at that particular point of time. And uh, uh, unfortunately, the manuscript, uh, Palmleaf manuscripts, are, uh, the writing system in Palmleaf manuscripts don't exist now because there's no experts or people to write in manuscripts. It kind of uh, died down in about 50 years or maybe uh, uh, 30 years ago. Uh, we hardly have any experts who still write in Palmleaf manuscripts. Mostly I'm talking about Tamil. You'll still find people in Odia, Odisha, where they still make uh, illuminated manuscripts with a lot of decorative elements and illustrations and even uh, Odia uh, script itself. But in Tamil, you will hardly find anybody who still writes in. So most of the examples that I'm showing you were all taken from museums and libraries. They kind of house them and there's no people to write. So uh, if you look at this uh, book, yeah, the printed book, you can see clearly see the uh, similarities between the, uh, the uh, palm leaf manuscripts writing system and also the, uh, the printed uh, typeface. And it is unlike how the current uh, Tamil script is, how the current Tamil, modern, uh, modern Tamil, you could say, the modern script is. Yeah, so, uh, so all, all of those earlier printed materials were had an inspirations from the manuscripts. You know? So that was their first source for them to kind of replicate and make types and then print. Yeah. <clears throat> Use it for uh, print. Over time then it got improved and then it kind of modified uh, in time. So uh, then again he also printed another book in 1570. And consecutively he was the only person who kind of was working on the printing, uh, uh, printing press and uh, was publishing books. And he also had this another interesting book, which is called Confessionario, and it was printed in a different location, which is in Cochin. Again, there's no copy of it. And one of the major uh, published books from his uh, time is this 1586 book, Flows Rank From. And uh, it is a, it was considered to be a huge volume, uh, about uh, more than uh, 200 or 300 pages. Uh, I, I, I read, and uh, so again, only few sample. Uh, pages are available uh, to look at it. Again, this also has a similar typefaces which which was printed in the the first two books. Yeah. So, so most of them have had the similar uh, uh, visual characteristics, unlike how it is seen in the present context. Yeah. So, so if you are so in my PhD, what I try to do is I so, uh, try to look at the printing phases and how printing actually influenced the script. And in this presentation, particularly, I'm kind of mostly focusing on the kind of uh, the evolution of printing alone, uh, more than talking about the typefaces. Uh, I do have another presentation which talks about the early typefaces and uh, detailing it out how typefaces have evolved within the printing itself and different stages of uh, evolution and how, how this current uh, typeface actually emerged. So in this mostly I was kind of looking at how uh, printing evolved. Uh, so after, uh, after this earlier uh, uh, till 1586, you will find examples of uh, printed books and materials. But after that, for another 100 years, you don't find any other material or any resources available. At least as far as the literature is concerned, uh, whatever that I was able to collect and uh, gather. There was only one exception and uh, it was in 1675, the, there was a, a printed material was found and uh, it was kind of a, a dictionary, a Tamil Portuguese dictionary printed by uh, the uh, 
a person called Antonio Di. I, I hope I'm pronouncing their name correctly. In uh, 1679, yeah, so this was considered to be one of the first uh, dictionary printed in, in any, any Indian language. And henceforth, then there were a lot of other printed uh, dictionaries. Uh, so one of the reasons said is that because there was a change in the political scenario, and the Portuguese or themselves they wanted to uh, get away from the Indian languages and they wanted to kind of focus on kind of communicating things in Portuguese, and they wanted the lo local uh, native people to learn Portuguese and also communicate in Portuguese. So that was one of the reasons. Probably there was kind of a difficulty in kind of continuing this uh, printing process and also the preaching process. So. Uh, and after that, there was also kind of a uh, lot more other European countries started to come into uh, India, so especially the Danish, who also brought in the Protestant uh, missionaries. Yeah, so the earlier they were Catholic uh, missionaries who were there in our country uh, who got settled. Even now, you'll find a lot of the settlements in uh, the Western Ghats, uh, especially in Goa. You'll find a lot of these Christian missionaries or the families who are uh, from from uh, the. Uh, Catholic uh, missionaries. Yeah, so uh, then, uh, like I said, the the Danish came into power and they kind of had a huge. Uh, they had expanded their territory in southern India, especially in Tamil Nadu, and they kind of established various missionaries and printing presses in in, in, in southern India. So one of the major press they established was this Tarangambadi, which is in, in English is called Tranquil Bar in 1713. One of the pioneers is this uh, Christian Protestant missionary Bartholomew Zegenbal, who was again uh, was instrumental in uh, spearheading the printing at that point of time in India, uh, in southern India to speak, uh, and in Tamil as well. And uh, he was kind of being credited for one of the uh, being the first person to uh, set up the Thai foundry in India, uh, in Poreyar in 1715, and also create a Thai foundry because they felt that uh, it was very difficult to kind of uh, get the type casted. What they typically do is that they used to uh, send samples to Europe, uh, the manuscripts, the palm leaf manuscripts, and uh, the types are casted in Europe and then shipped back to India. And then the, they use those metal types for printing in India. But then uh, it was becoming a very difficult situation for the missionaries to kind of continue with that kind of a process because it took longer time and it consumed so much of uh, uh, days and months for uh, things to get. Uh, sometimes it even gets destroyed in between. So they weren't even sure of whether the type will arrive or not, and similarly getting papers were also was very challenging. So then he was one of the first to kind of set up the printing press type foundry itself. He kind of uh, they brought in artisans and they taught the local people how to kind of typecast, and also uh, they also kind of create uh, set up this paper mill uh, in 1715. So it is supposed to be as one of the first, uh, but of course again these are all uh, from whatever the resources that I have gathered. Uh, through my uh, research, uh, and uh, so this was one of the first books printed in uh, Taranganbadi in 1714. Uh, it was called the Four Evangelists, and you can see uh, the uh, there is a little bit of an improvement as compared to the earlier printed books. If you look at the typefaces, the, the, you have this hierarchy if, in terms of the page layout is concerned. You have a difference in points uh, type sizes. Yeah, you have a headline, and then you have a body copy, and they are centered, and this is. Uh, typical uh, traditional book typography, if you can see, uh, central line, perfectly central line, and uh, with uh, variations in type, and also with uh, uh, illustrations at the end. Yeah, so uh, something which was uh, adapted in the Europe at that point of time in terms of book design and how typography kind of was in prevalent. Yeah. Uh, so slowly changes came, and you can also see the improvements in the type, yeah, unlike the earlier examples. Uh, and this press kind of continued for more than a century and it was operational uh, and uh, was working well and it had a lot more uh, publishing, uh, uh, published materials, all kinds of materials from posters to pamphlets to books. Uh, though, uh, of course, I, I, I don't have access to those uh, examples to show you. Yeah. And then uh, after the Danish, then there came the British who kind of uh, defeated the French, who were mostly colonizing the Pondicherry region, which is in the eastern uh, Tamil Nadu in the coastal areas. And when they took over the Pondicherry, they also kind of uh, uh, they brought the press from the uh, the French, and uh, they installed it in Madras, which is Chennai, and they made uh, Chennai their capital. The, the present day Chennai was as well uh, Madras. Yeah? So the entire South India was called as Madras Presidency and under the British rule. 
and uh, so they also tried to kind of bring in a lot more type and uh, so printing started to happen in madras from then and they had a lot more reach and uh, uh, so british were were in power and they had the control of how uh, things were published uh, in terms of printing is concerned and so on and they also established printing presses in other parts of the country uh, in sarampur in calcutta in west bengal and so uh, so on and uh, this press is still operational yeah which was set up earlier in uh, in in, in uh, 17 uh, late 1700s and uh, it's now been used by the government to print of print all the government publications and it's called the government press it's still there in beperi yeah so it's still functional uh, so here you can see the the uh, the various uh, time timeline of how how uh, printing presses started to emerge in southern india uh, and uh, then further on it also went on to other parts of the country especially because of the british who had control in all the other parts of the country and and uh, bengal was there another major uh, 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 foothold they had and their press in serampur and serampur printing press was again very well known uh, it it was kind of coined by the uh, if i remember charles wilkinson who kind of uh, help uh, uh, create bengali typefaces and also a lot of other interesting typefaces uh, and start printing a lot of uh, materials yeah, especially the government uh, publications uh, public uh, published materials and we also had uh, printing presses coming in mumbai as well and delhi uh, so again like here is another chart which kind of shows how the 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 way how presses started to emerge uh, in india yeah. and most of them you can find the red colors are all in the northern northern part of the country and all the other the black is mostly in the southern part yeah. uh, so the, and of course i also would uh, kind of did a lot of research into in each uh, printing phases what was their unique characteristics and what actually happened and what kind of amount of material they printed so this is how i kind of concluded in uh, to an extent that there were three phases printing phases which he had in our country so one is the, basically the portuguese missionaries who had an extensive printing and then the danish and then the british so that's this is how i kind of classified how uh, letterpress printing happened in in uh, tamil uh, script uh, and in india to speak uh, and this uh, chart also shows the other indian scripts when was it first printed yeah so tamil being one of the first and uh, these are the other uh, scripts as i mentioned the bengali was printed in 1743 that is because of the establishment of the serampur print uh, printing press yeah when the uh, government uh, when the british was uh, ruling yeah so uh, yeah so basically I, I just wanted to give you an overview of uh, uh, printing in the indian uh, context yeah so these are some of the references uh, which i had and uh, yeah, so thank you so i just uh, uh, in fact this was uh, another uh, what was a paper i can present it in ictvc uh, in uh, cyprus uh, so i thought i should uh, share it with our own people here so it, it would be nice uh, because I, I i suppose you might be able to relate it uh, with your own uh, context uh, the sri lankan printing and how emerged in fact i had some kind of an idea of uh, when the sri lankan uh, letterpress printing started and i thought i should kind of share this again with you uh, uh, in that context yeah so so thank you uh, all for uh, being patiently uh, listening so maybe if i i can kind of disconnect the share and then get back with the thing yeah, so but thank you uh, professor uday thanks a lot because no, it was more like a eye opener and we also understood that um, there is a lot of similarities when it comes to print history except you all are talking uh, a little bit of a, a bigger uh, time difference but uh, the whole evolution looks the same for us in sri lanka as well so of course we have uh, starting from the portuguese followed by uh, the Dutch and the British coming to Sri Lanka as well. So, well, Pedro, there is, there is some sort of history there <laughs> from that end. He's a common man there. <laughs> yeah. Don't yeah. blame me, please. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm quite uh, happy uh, that this panel has become so uh, interesting because uh, 
we also managed to link our own histories and also see what is important and mostly uh, a subject like typography is linking us all together and and that is the amazing thing about uh, uh, the magic of type that is how i would call it Thank so you. Uh, so um, just seeing if uh, we have any questions for um, Uday, Professor Uday. Um, okay, so right now I'm sure uh, the audience must be stunned to know the whole history. <laughs> That's all right. Now we don't have any questions, but uh, I would ask you a question, uh, especially uh, one would be is how, what were your challenges, uh, Professor Uday, when it came to collecting this data? Because I, I, I I can understand how tough it was for you, but um, what, what were the the most uh, uh, unforgettable uh, moments that you faced when collecting? Oh, there are plenty. Yeah, I don't know which one to say. There was a lot of things. Yeah, so yeah, I had a lot of struggle in collecting materials for my research. Uh, so when I started the PhD program, I mean when I. Uh, the IIT Bombay started its PhD program. So I was one of the first to do the PhD in IIT, IDC Bombay. Uh, uh, so I, I did not have any precedence. And uh, being a graphic designer, I did not know how to do research, first of all. Uh, so I was a very no voice and I was just beginning and I did not know how to go about doing research. I was familiar, I mean, we do design and we do a bit of research, but it is unlike how you do a PhD research. I'm sure rest of my speakers would agree and yeah, so phd research is completely altogether is different yeah you need to do spend a lot of time and dedicate a lot of time so i was no wise i had no idea i, I did not have my seniors or my predecessors so that was a challenge first to kind of tackle how to do a research and then trying to identify a problem statement and framing an hypothesis and objective aim and that was another challenge <laughs> and then further going on to understand first, to get to understand hypothesis, what is hypothesis itself took longer time for me, where I had no idea because sometimes designers, they, we don't read much. We, we are interested in design things and we like to design, but we hardly read, <laughs> at least from I, I, from my own students, I can tell. It. So, so reading uh, become a habit and then I understood hypothesis and where I got to know a lot of research and research methodologies. Yeah, so I got to learn. And uh, then after that, then when you want to look to work on a subject which is very narrow like tamil typography and it becomes even more difficult to kind of find materials for your research for there because nobody has ever done it's very all scattered here and there and you have to kind of put them together hunt for them trying to find establish the right contact and even if you have contact say for example you find a go to a library and they have a good amount of resources and to build a trust and why would they want to give access to you to kind of get a hold of the manuscripts because they are all fragile and they are old and they wanted to preserve it and they don't want to just open it up and they don't want to get it spoiled or lost yeah, because and they will not get this because they are all very traditional artifacts and they want to preserve it and they are precious to them and that building a trust again I, I have to visit for three continuous years I have to kind of travel back to Tamil Nadu again and again to the same library, library and then convince them and then they find that okay this guy is coming one I, every time again and again so okay, let's give it uh, so so then i got to get an access after two years sometimes after three years in certain libraries and then my research started yeah so till then you have to be patient you're frustrated you don't find people and uh, the right contacts so it took time uh, so these are challenges and uh, and then again you are alone taking pictures of those manuscripts uh, so then one time i kind of really nearly shot 5000 images of manuscripts and maybe 1,000, uh, 1,020, uh, 1,500 shots of printed uh, books. And I felt sick. Yeah, I was just shooting one continuous week because that was the time frame they allowed me access. And I thought I should make use of it and I have to finish it off. So I was just continuously shooting like a mad person to get uh, the best of it. And then the next one month I was sick with fever, with all body pain and everything. So my fingers got frozen. So. I had tough time. So this element, since you asked something which is memorable, I will never forget this in my life. So, so it was tough uh, going to all of these challenges. So, yeah, I can go on. So these are to just say you 
Yeah. <laughs> now it is so good to hear, and I'm sure there is a lot of um, level final year students who are listening to this, and I'm sure they are right now at this point of uh, starting their research work, okay. and I'm sure it was what you said made sense a uh, lot to them because you know being designers, you rarely read, and then yeah. you're getting into this uh, whole stage of researching is a challenge, but um, you know it comes around ultimately, yeah. and. Um, Okay, so we do have a question. Um, yeah. Uh, hi, Uday Kumar. Can you give a short brief about the Brahmi language? Is a question coming to you. Yeah, so uh, Brahmi language is, uh, like I said, was the mother of many of the uh, Indian scripts. In fact, all of the Indian scripts to speak, and they are very simple. Yeah, it, it, uh, it kind of uh, dates back to beyond 300 BC. Yeah. So, and they are very simple forms. I, I can show you some examples. I, I wish I had put that slides of the Brahmi scripts and all of them kind of emerged. And Pali was the language uh, which the Brahmi scripts were used. Yeah, so Pali was the ancient language of our uh, country, Indian country. Yeah. And it all started because of the uh, Buddhism. Yeah. So what happened is this, it, only because of the Buddhism, they, uh, in, in Buddhism, so they wanted to kind of carry forward what Buddha had preached. Yeah. And they wanted to document it and put it in a very uh, uh, like permanent form. Yeah. So otherwise, we are an oral tradition. Yeah. So uh, all our literatures and uh, all our knowledge is passed through oral. Yeah. So we kind of we have a guru shishya parampara. You have a guru who will kind of teach his uh, disciples, and the disciple will later on become a uh, guru, and he will teach his disciple, and so on. For centuries, we've been in an oral tradition, and only during the Buddhism. Uh, and at that point of time, they wanted to record everything what uh, Buddha had actually preached. And that's how they wanted to have a, a system. So the, all the written communication starts from that point of view. Yeah. And then you will find a lot of these uh, scripts emerging from then on when they went to different parts of the country, different parts of India to kind of preach Buddhism. And then scripts started to evolve and also the languages and everything started to come in. Yeah. So this is my uh, my understanding of the history. Yeah? So th that is how uh, the Brahmi and various other scripts got to come come into picture. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so um, we are also running short of time, but uh, uh, Dr. Pedro, uh, were you able to uh, find the print that you uh, get from downstairs? Uh, was I able to find? Sorry. Were you able to find the print that you were trying to show us uh, from downstairs? Uh, no, I have to go to the garage. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that, not a problem. Uh, okay, so just to um, uh, you know, recap on what we've learned today and with the, the whole discussion is uh, uh, what, what was so interesting about today was the fact that uh, this particular subject has actually got us to start thinking and looking back and uh, and to do something to the current society today and uh, each one of us uh, one of all of us have actually contributed in such a way so pedro you have done an amazing thing where we've understood that you know letterpress printing where nobody would even bother about but um, you would just go there and start introducing uh, first of all documenting them and finding yeah. and also giving Jumping them the yeah, yeah. <laughs> and giving them life you know and tell them okay you 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 make sense and uh, and also seeing how it has been uh, transformed into something amazing into that can be used today so thank you so much for the work you're doing and again uh, similar work is done by joe of course uh, who's who's digging into uh, Yes, the archives and all those places that you've been going to. I, I was actually curious to know how you felt when you found that whole bulk of Tibetan type specimens which you had to sort out. What was your feeling, Joe? Hmm. <laughs> well, it was yeah, impressive in a sense. First, I was um, very much eager to start working with it. Uh, but when I started looking at the sorts, I noticed what's happening. Everything is muddled. Yeah. Um, so then, yeah, yeah, I had the idea because luckily I had some typecases from other Tibetan uh, typefaces, like the cases. And normally, I say normally, uh, for one specific writing system, 
uh, because it's uh, related to the frequency count of each of the sorts, um, that the box of the individual sorts is bigger or smaller. So luckily I had some type cases that I found in uh, printed books uh, and some of the other uh, uh, type cases themselves. So I could, I could use that existing one to actually start um, sorting uh, the rest of the, the metal type. Um, but it, was, it took a lot of time. Oh, not, yeah. not, not just this, but it's like, oh, what's happening? And I, I had to do it because I really wanted to find out by myself how the different composing uh, methods worked. And so, yes, but again, yeah. it's, it's a very incredible and, and, and memorable experience as well. So. Yeah, I'm sure it would have been like uh, Professor Udair's, uh, you know, the beak of taking shots and falling sick the following week. Mm -hmm. True, <laughs> yeah. true, true, true. Yeah. No, but, now, uh, but, but now they are all sorted. So every case <laughs> lay is in perfect order. So. Very nice. Thanks to you. Yeah, well. <laughs> well done, yeah, because um, like, this is the thing. So this is. It was really lovely to have three of the three of you on board, and I'm sure it's like uh, this is. It's such an eye opener. Mainly is uh, to go back into history and telling us exactly what needs to, what can be done. And obviously, uh, I know a lot of things that you are didn't know, tell because uh, clearly with all this knowledge that you gain. Uh, each one of your are designers yourselves and all that knowledge is being used for today's whatever the work you're doing and uh, so part of the research could be something else but yes there is a huge contribution that you're giving so thank you and thank you for inspiring the whole audience and thank you for coming on board and uh, making our full collective uh, discussion so lively and so uh, vivid actually from from all over and still being able to connect together. So appreciate your time. Thank, thank you so much. And thank you. Thank you also for bringing us together and together, for organizing yeah, this you. event. Yes, so exactly. Thank thanks. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Then till we meet again. Bye. Yeah, for sure. See you Bye. soon. See you. Bye. 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 Okay. Bye. -bye.